everyone, I'm Tony Doolin. I'm the Dean of the Honors College and super excited about today's session. This is actually our final Dean and Friends conversation that's scheduled for fall term. We're moving into that um, busy time of, well, you're probably still taking midterms even though it's week seven or eight, I forget which of the, the term. And I know it's been a particularly uh, busy and, and stressful um, term, so thanks for joining us. Today we have Dr. Katherine Parker, and she's joining us, as she said, from England. Um, it's actually her evening, so I think it's just a bit after 8 p.m. Uh, Katie graduated from OSU with her honors degree in history and international studies back in 2010, and she then earned her uh, master's of arts and PhD in history from the University of Pittsburgh. Her research focuses on the production of geographic knowledge about the Pacific Ocean during the 18th century. And then she broadly specializes in the history of cartography, the history of the book, the history of the empire, Pacific history and maritime history with a particular emphasis on Great Britain, thus probably her current location. Currently, she's a research officer at the Barry Lawrence, is it Ruderman Antiques <laughs> Maps, where she investigates, manages and writes about a collection of 60,000 maps and she teaches at Queen Mary University in London. And she's joined us today to talk about how maps communicate power and bias, which is just such an interesting topic. I'm really excited for it. Um, it's great that many of you have your cameras on. We know that not everybody has internet bandwidth to allow for that, but uh, feel free to turn your camera on if you can. Um, and then for the um, question and, and answer when we get to that part of it, if you can't use your camera, uh, when you turn on participants, you can use the raise your hand function and then Kevin and I'll try to monitor that. So we'll make okay. sure that. Okay, hope that's visual for everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to go through. I just made a few slides because maps are visual objects. So it's easier if we can all see them. Um, we got my introduction to me. I was in the class of 2010, uh, back when they had the international studies program. I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that exists anymore. Um, so it was a really way. cool, <laughs> not in the same way. Okay, so it was a sweet program that required you to go fourth year in a language and then do a study abroad of at least 10 weeks. I did six months in Santiago, Chile. Um, and then if you fulfilled all the requirements, which was um, some weird magic with your gen ed classes as well, uh, then you would get a second bachelor's degree in international studies and you could pair it with any major you were doing. So I was history from the beginning. Um, so I was lucky enough to do that and it was absolutely amazing um, and it was 10 years ago now, which is slightly terrifying, hadn't really thought about it. Okay, so I am a specialist in the history of cartography. Um, there are probably worldwide about 300 people who are specialists in this, so it's not a super popular field, but I would argue it's very important. Um, so historians, as you guys probably know, use artifacts from the past to understand um, what happened in the past and hopefully um, trying to shed some light on how things work in the present. Maps are a really important part of that and yet very few historians end up using them. Uh, they, maps can be a little intimidating. In the 20th century we think of maps as very um, objective, that they share spatial information um, and that they tell us where we are. I would argue that that's a total lie and it's not true at all. Maps are usually lying to you and there's actually a book um, by roughly that title. Um, so I studied the 18th century, um, but I also cover a broader period from about 1500 to 1800, which is called the early modern period. Um, so I'm sharing here on the screen, this is Mars Pacifici, um, which is the first map of the Pacific Ocean ever printed. Um, and you see New Guinea is this giant island there off on the, hopefully the left side for you. You have a massive southern continent, which is not actually what exists as we know. Antarctica doesn't look like that. Uh, we see a weird bulge where Alaska should be and Oregon's looking much larger than it should be. So this isn't to say that people in the past were wrong, but maps are always best guesses, amalgamations and comp compilations from the sources that were available to the maker. This maker is Abraham Ortelius. He's a contemporary of Gerard Mercator, who you might have heard of. Um, and this map is just one of my favorites because it's, um, again, the first map of the Pacific, which is my area of expertise um, and my favorite region to study. 
So my road to maps, um, I am a historian more generally, um, and so maps aren't the only thing I guess I do. It's hard to do only maps. There's only two, three professorships in the history of cartography in the world. Um, so it's not exactly a growth market in terms of jobs, um, but that's fine. You could make up a job, which is what I did. Um, so I was a second year graduate student at the University of Pittsburgh. And um, while I was there, I was starting to look into Pacific exploration and trying to understand how Europeans learned about the Pacific as a region, um, because they hadn't experienced it prior to 1513 is the first time a European sights the Pacific Ocean, and then 1519 to 1522, we're actually in the 500th anniversary of it right now, is when Magellan is the first person to circumnavigate the globe. Um, of course, indigenous peoples knew about the Pacific long before this. Uh, they view spatiality in a very different way, um, which is why when I talk about mapping, I'm mostly talking from a European perspective, um, which is in no way to denigrate indigenous knowledge. And to be honest, the Europeans I study would have no idea what European, what indigenous knowledge even was. They weren't really good at it. And they were very frustrated that the indigenous people didn't speak the languages they spoke, which is a bit silly of them. Um, so as I was going through my initial research, the first time I came to London for research was in the summer of 2011. Um, I kept coming in contact with maps as sources, and I wasn't able to read them. With historical sources, if it's a text, we kind of all know how to read, although as a historian of the book, I can also complicate that for you. But maps, you do kind of need to know some basics to understand how they were made and therefore what kind of information you can or can't get from them. And as a second year grad student, I didn't know that at all. So I kind of dove into this field, which is the history of cartography or the history of maps and mapping, um, and started to just read. Um, in history or any of the humanities, really most of what you do is read. And so that's mostly also what I do with my job. Literally today I read for eight hours and it was amazing. Um, but I read a lot of the books that already existed. And then as I gained expertise, I was able then to apply what I was learning to my own research um, in the 18th century Pacific. So that took roughly two to three years before I was able to really present or talk with any expertise on the subject. Um, and then luckily, as I was finishing up my PhD, um, I stumbled into a job, which is not necessarily normal. Um, so I was able, as I finished my PhD, you do need to get copyright for images you use. <laughs> and as a map specialist, I had a lot of maps, so they're images. And then I met my now boss by asking him if he'd give me permission to use his maps for free, because he's a map dealer, so he sells antique maps. Um, and he was interested in my dissertation, he asked to read it. And upon reading it, asked if I did then wanted to work full time for him, which is something you should usually answer yes to. Um, so he allowed me, um, this is very singular, I am the only person in the world with my job, but that doesn't mean that you all can't forge a path similar. Um, so he asked me to basically write my own job description, designing a research based position within a private company, which is his map dealership. So I don't buy and sell the maps at all. I couldn't tell you what any of these maps are worth, but I do research and manage our collection of, I think we're up to 65,000 map images now. So in many ways, I'm an academic that's housed with a private company. So I manage our in-house archive, basically. Uh, and half my time is spent on working on that archive of images. And the other half of my time is spent publishing um, in scholarly journals and uh, books. Just had a book out last month, which was very exciting. It was my first one. Uh, so that was how I kind of joined the field, started presenting at conferences and things, which I hope you guys might have a chance to do um, as undergrads. OSU does have undergrad conferences, or if you see those advertised elsewhere, go for it. They're great experiences. And then now, um, it sounds a bit hubristic to say it, but I would say I am a leader in the field of history of cartography. I hold leadership positions in most of the governing bodies, so the International Society for the History of the Map, which is a really long name that we call ISHMAP, um, and several other organizations. So I'm part of a group of younger scholars, because most of the scholars are a little bit old. Um, and I'm part of a group of this younger scholars who are trying to steer the field away from Eurocentric topics and more in the focus of bringing in other ideas about history in terms of gender and indigenous studies and bring them to bear on the history of the map. 
And to that end, I organize a conference at Stanford every other year. And in 2019, we looked at gender sexuality and cartography. And in 2021, we'll be looking at indigenous mapping. Um, so that's kind of how I got to where I am. Now let's just talk about maps and not me. So maps are power objects. I'm gonna be focusing mostly on early modern maps, but we could say the same thing and do the same analysis for maps in the 20th century. And arguably I would say 20th and 21st century, especially born digital maps are even sneakier in the way they're actually kind of operating on the way you're thinking. So maps have always been power objects. And I just have a couple examples here on the hopefully left side of your screen is um, this is the Amsterdam Town Hall, which is actually for reasons of history, now the Royal Palace in Amsterdam, but it was originally meant for the burghers in Amsterdam. So it was meant for the people of the town. And this is the main central hall that they have. You'll see in the back in the middle, um, Atlas holding a globe, but I actually wanna draw your attention down to the floor where there are three globes inlaid in marble in the floor. These are roughly 20 feet in diameter they're massive um, and they are based on globes that were actual 3D globes that were made by a firm called the Blau family. They're a very famous firm in uh, the 17th century Amsterdam and in the center is a celestial globe, so a globe of the stars. And these globes were set intentionally in the town hall when it was made in 1655 to convey the global reach of Dutch maritime commerce. So the Dutch are interesting politically, they're not so focused on monarchy um, and they're much more focused at a town level in terms of their power. So Amsterdam wished to project their power and their reach into especially the Dutch East Indies and they chose to do so by embedding globes into the floor of their town hall where anyone in Amsterdam could visit. And then now on the right side, um, hopefully, uh, if it's mixed up just switch it for me. Um, but on the right side here, we have what's called the Armada portrait. It is Queen Elizabeth I, if you were guessing. You can tell by her fancy clothes. Um, and so she, there are th actually three Armada portraits that survive. Right now, they're all at the Queen's house, um, which is the Royal Maritime Museum here in uh, Greenwich, which is actually where I live. But I can't see them because of COVID, so I'm a bit bummed. But these are the Armada. So this is a, one of three Armada portraits, and I just want to draw your attention down to her right hand, which is placed on a globe. Very strangely, this globe is not put into a stand. So in reality, this object never would have existed because you wouldn't have a globe outside of a stand, um, either a stand that would rest on the ground or one that would rest on a table. Um, but the goal of including the globe within this portrait is to show the global reach of England. At this point, that's more, um, this is 1588 when the Spanish Armada is defeated. That's more of a um, goal of England than a reality at this point. But including globes in portraiture, which happens all the way through into the 19th century, show kind of a triumvirate of power, knowledge, and then possession. Um, that you are in somehow you have either visited there or your empire is in charge of that area, even if there's already people living there. And then the third object I want to share here in the middle, this is called a pocket globe. It's only about three inches in diameter. And these were quite popular in the 18th century. And they were owned by merchants who literally would just carry them in their pockets. Um, so we see it's just made of um, card, what is the equivalent of cardboard? So wood and extra paper stuffs. And then they would glue the gores, which are strips onto the globe itself. It's very difficult to make. And then the inside of the case you can see next to it, that's a celestial globe. So you would have celestial and terrestrial, you'd have the pair right there in your hand. And then the case was usually made of leather or actually shark skin, which is called chagrin. Um, and those were owned by merchants originally, and they would carry them around their pockets as a way to show their worldliness and the fact that they are in the world. And then later in the 18th century, they would be used by school children. You'd have a big globe up in the front of the class, and then you as a student would have your little pocket globe in your hand so you could follow along. And that's because geographic knowledge, especially in European empires in the later 18th century, it was very important for students to know all about geography because that allowed them to be masters of empire because all the European empires had expanded at that point. So those are objects. Let's talk a little bit more about knowledge as power. 
So again, I just want to show a couple of quick examples. I realize that these images are not huge. Um, so on the left, we have a new map of the world, um, which is by Robert Green in London, and that's from 1676, so the late 17th century. And I'm not so actually interested in the map here. I'm more interested in the corners. And in the corners, starting the top left, you have Europe, then top right is Asia, lower right is Africa, and then lower left is America. I know you can't see them very well, but this is a very common trope within maps, but also within art called the four continents. And the whole goal of it was to show how civilized and developed Europe was as compared to despotic Asia, to um, kind of barbaric Africa and then savage America. And this is gonna be clearly a European conception of the world that shows, and it's a way of Europe justifying its empire and it's a way of um, justifying uh, subjecting people to in some ways enslavement, but also to imperial invasion. So there's actual visual ways in which Europe justified their entire takeover of the entire world. And this one doesn't have them as much. No, it doesn't. They're just wearing clothes, but usually they're associated with animals in the four continents trope. So Europe will almost always be on a bull. Asia will be on an elephant. Africa will be on a camel. And then America will almost always have an alligator, weirdly. And often the alligator is massive. So I would actually argue that America is going to win that one because she has a really crazy animal. And they're always women as well. Um, and usually Europe is the only one that's clothed. So you can see it's a really Eurocentric and very hierarchical view of the world. And maps were a way in which that hierarchy was normalized to people. Um, and as we'll see in a second, indigenous people were not given space within these map objects. So on the right here, this is a map of um, the, the tip of South America. It shows the Straits of Magellan. And again, I don't need you to focus on the geography at all, um, but I want you to see that there is a cartouche, which is where the title is, and there's little cherubim and little babies in there. Um, and that is interesting to me as a scholar, because if you look at the versions of this map, this is the final version. It was published in 1711. There's earlier versions dating back to 1670, in manuscript, then 1673, and then 1696. And in the original manuscript, this is an English explorer named Narborough, and he wrote all of these amazing notes about the indigenous peoples he's encountered and their languages and the ways in which they live, and he drew a bunch of pictures of them, and it's all over the manuscript map. When you go to 1673, about half of his notes and his images have been taken away because they weren't considered to follow the convention of European mapping. When we get to 1696, we're gonna see the only indigenous peoples that are mentioned on the map at all are going to be, they're moved up to the cartouche and they're used as decoration. And then here in the final map, 1711, we see the indigenous peoples have been erased entirely. So even though we think of maps as objective kind of representations of space, what is chosen to be included both in decoration and also in geographic information is actually highly selective and it's a way to project power to project possession and also to take power away from other people and almost always that's going to happen with um, indigenous populations in the early modern period which is is the period i look at and then just to finish off here um i did i didn't want to end us on a depressing note um, so there are, of course, indigenous uh, map ways. Actually, maps are a very European object. Other indigenous groups around the world um, didn't make maps in the same way at all. If you look at Asian mapping, it looks absolutely different than European mapping. And then if you look at a lot of indigenous communities, they didn't map in the way we do. Pacific Islands were settled um, originally by what are now we call Polynesian people, and they in no way ever had a paper or a written map tradition. It was an oral tradition that was passed down through experiential learning and mnemonic devices. And they are the best sailors in the world. So you can't say that system wasn't working. Um, so we need to understand that maps themselves are not a universal construct. They are a social construct specific to a historical context and to a historical time. In the 20th and 21st centuries, we are seeing that a lot of scholars and indigenous peoples themselves are re trying to reclaim mapping as a tool that can actually undermine empire as opposed to support settler colonialism. 
So just two examples of this on the right side, this is a University of Texas project um, on participatory mapping. And this is a project down in Ecuador where they uh, anthropologists connected with indigenous communities to better understand the ecology of the area. So this is um, an imaging of the kind of location, but also the variety of different tree pop um, tree species that exist in the area that this indigenous group lives in, which is knowledge that can't be is not understood by Western science. And then um, so they decided to do participatory mapping. So that's a community based project. And these projects exist um, around the world. And then on the left, one of my favorite apps um, slash websites, this is nativelands.ca. You can get it on your phone as Native Lands. It's an app. And it will tell you around the world, um, they're working on, we can see Africa isn't as covered. Um, but especially for North America, it will tell you whose indigenous land you are on at any time. And so for a place like I do conferences at Stanford, and we need to do a land claim um, declaration at the beginning of every um, conference to admit that we are on indigenous land and land that was not ever ceded. And I think if Oregon State looks into it, they'll see the same is happening there. And so land claim declarations are very common in the Pacific world, especially in Aotearoa, which is New Zealand. And it's something I would like to see more of. They're also common in Canada. And I'd like to see more of them um, in the US. And so this is just a handy app to let you know whose land you are originally on at any one time. Um, so it's a neat app and it's kind of just fun if you're traveling around to see where you are at any one time and on whose land, which is usually not ceded land, you are. So there are ways in which mapping can be taken back by communities, not just indigenous communities, um, but uh, minority communities that have been historically redlined in the past and not allowed to live in certain neighborhoods and cities. There's a lot of programs that use mapping to help to fight against that. And also um, in terms of national di natural disasters, um, there are a lot of mapping projects that are kind of the first people on the ground and they create from scratch digital maps from the moment they land. And that will then help first responders to actually know what has changed and what is happening in that area. For example, after an earthquake or a flood. So that's what I wanted to share with you guys. And then hopefully you have some questions. That's just an Oregon map for all of you. I thought you might want it. Um, I'm gonna stop screen sharing though. Okay, and now I can see all of you. So I'd love to answer questions if anyone wants to share any. And in the chat. Oh, okay, so Tony's yes, that excellent that in, um, that OSU has an indigenous land recognition statement. It's becoming more and more common. Um, and we're doing, like I said, at Stanford next year, um, in 2021, we're doing an indigenous mapping conference, and we're working with their um, Native American Cultural Center to make sure that they're very involved in the process. Yeah, and I, I love. I think it's OSU, uh, important to know at um, OSU that this actually came from the UAOSU, um, the not UAOSU, um, ASOSU. Sorry. Uh, so it came from the um, student government body to enact, and I think it was two years ago now. And um, uh, at all major university events, this is part of the kind of the protocol, if you will. Mm -hmm which is excellent. Mm -hmm. And now I think, I'm not sure, is it called Native American Cultural Center? Or it's called the Longhouse, isn't it? Yeah, and, and um, we worked not just with them, but all of the various tribes across the Willamette Valley in mm -hmm. uh, coming up with the statement. So Allison Davis White Eyes was probably here when you were here and um, she, was. she was really pivotal, pivotal in, in helping OSU. Um, work towards this and making sure we appropriately identified the, the correct tribe. And as you can imagine, there was, um, even the language used is really import important. So talking about the forcible removal um, was really important to acknowledging the, the history. 
for sure. And then the longhouse wasn't there when I was there. They were still in a Quonset hut in a corner <laughs> next to um, the business dorm across the corner yes. from that. And that's that. That's where they're at now, but in a beautiful. Yeah, in a beautiful building. <laughs> yeah. It looks like Carrington has a question. Can you talk about gender and maps, and how about biased maps used to, and how biased maps used today are like Google Maps? Oh, cool. So gender and maps is um, really, really new information. I, I'm supposed to be writing an article about it um, and haven't done it yet. Um, but gender and maps, um, in some ways, it can hold up norms just the way that we hold up European norms about ways of seeing things. Um, maps can exclude information. Um, so a lot of the speakers we had at the conference um, come from the queer community, and they talked about how certain resources or safe spaces for um, people who identify in the LGBTQ um, uh, A plus community, how they don't feel included in a lot of maps because a lot of the spaces that are seen as public are not welcome to them in terms of public displays of affection and things like that. Um, so we had a wonderful artist from Canada sharing a map um, which she had started in the Toronto area where people from the queer community could log um, moments in their lives on this map um, it could be moments where they were discriminated against, but by far the vast majority were actually moments of kind of queer happiness. So where they had a first kiss or where they had just an experience where they felt accepted in some way. Um, and so that was an attempt again at participatory mapping to try and be more inclusive of experiences and meanings of places beyond the kind of normative meanings we usually give objects, which are almost always going to be cis um, in their presentation in some way is a way. And then another way in which gender uh, plays out in maps is that almost all maps historically, even today, are made by men. It's a very male dominated field even today. Um, there have been some amazing female scholars, but they are definitely the minority. And so if men are the ones historically making maps, there's also going to be certain choices which are made of what to include and how to make maps um, that perhaps women would not have made <laughs> if they were making the maps. But at the same time, I know I want to um, give the idea that women were not involved. Um, so a very common way in which women did get involved in the 18th century um, was if their husbands died prematurely, which happened a lot. Um, they would then inherit often the printing press that their husbands were using, and very many of them um, would continue to print uh, and then would continue to do original work as well, which means that they were hiring the engravers and they were the ones verifying the information and then printing the object itself. So there were women involved, but they are definitely the minority in the overall situation, which is still the case today um, with GIS and with a lot of the more digital techniques of making maps. And Google Maps is very biased in terms of what it includes and how it labels things. Sorry, I forgot that part of the question. <laughs> you talked about spending a lot of time reading. I do spend so much time reading. Um, I'd love to hear what a typical day of research and or work looks like for you. Ah, good question. <laughs> Before 2020 or during 2020? Um, I do read a lot. You have to read a lot. As an academic, that's just what you do. Um, you need to stay on top of the literature. And honestly, I just I like reading. It's one of the reasons I became a historian. I, it's just, I like reading really good work. Um, so typically, every day I need to write a map essay that goes on our website. And those are usually 1,000 to 1,500 words, depending what it is. And every day it's different. So I could be doing a map of 1950s Thailand today. Tomorrow I'll be doing 1472, a Ptolemaic map, which doesn't look anything like what the world actually looks like. So it's kind of every day, it's very different in terms of that part of my job. Um, and then that'll be about half the day. And then the rest of the day will be spent on my own research, which will be either reading or taking notes, <laughs> take a lot of notes, um, or then writing. So drafting articles and things like that. Um, I also do a lot of presentations, um, so a lot of conference presentations, and in 2020, I've actually gotten to attend way more conferences than normal because they're all on Zoom, so I don't have to travel for them, which is great. So I did a conference last week on um, maps and coloring, which oddly enough was two whole days on that subject, which you wouldn't think you could do that. And then uh, next week I'm attending one um, on hydrocoloniality talking about the interaction of maritime spaces and colonial dispossession. 
but mostly reading. It is a lot of reading. As we wait for some additional questions, can you comment on how, especially in the, the space that you are a scholar and a researcher, how do you check your own biases and basically the worldviews that you have that have been shaped by, you know, how you were raised, where you lived? So how do you check that as you do the work that you do as a scholar? Definitely. No, that's a great question. Um, I think it depends what I'm working on. So when I'm working in terms of coordinating or planning an academic program, especially if I'm doing something like a topic like indigenous mapping or gender and sexuality, um, I might be organizing the event, but after the actual event, I need to take a back seat and listen much more than I talk. And so give the space and the voice um, to those who are one, doing the work, but also two, experiencing um, whatever form of discrimination or oppression we are talking about. And sadly, when we are talking about gender, sexuality, and Indigenous studies, there's almost always <laughs> intense oppression and discrimination going on. Um, so it's a lot of, I guess, stepping back and listening and not wanting to hear my own voice, which is very hard for me. But um, in terms of my own research and writing, oh, that's hard. I guess it's just something you have to be constantly constantly checking every paragraph you write you just need to make sure that you're not presenting that from a certain situation or you're not making assumptions um, i read a friend's work today um, and it's a great article full of original research but i had to underline a few things and say i think you're assuming this rather than proving it so as historians we have to prove points with documentation and archival material and material culture and so I always need to be showing rather than telling. And I think that's a way to make sure that you're checking your bias is that you're grounding whatever you're saying within a historical context, within a historical object. So that you're forwarding what the history is telling you, not necessarily what you're telling you. That said, all of history is an interpretation. So there's no true history. It's always going to be slightly inflected by me or by whoever's writing the history. Can you talk about being a professor? Carrington, I wish I was a professor. <laughs> um, so I am actually what you call an adjunct. So my full-time job is to work as research officer managing um, the, the collection that I manage. So in many ways, I'm closer to like an archivist or a librarian, I think is how you'd classify it. But then um, I do teach and I love teaching. So I teach at Queen Mary University of London. Right now I'm teaching a class called Global Encounters. This week we studied the Haitian Revolution. Um, last week we studied, actually last week was reading week. We, it was midterms, we didn't have last week. Um, the week before we did the transatlantic slave trade. The week before that we did the voyages of Captain Cook and indigenous reactions to that in artwork. So that's a great class that everything's different every week and you have to just kind of stay a week ahead of the students, which anyone who's ever taught a class can identify with. Um, so I've taught a variety of subjects. And so it's just every semester at Queen Mary, they kind of give me whatever they have, which is great. Um, as a Europeanist, I'm more of a generalist than a lot of people. So I can teach, I'm willing to teach almost anything, which a lot of people aren't. So I've taught um, history of architecture, which was really hard, <laughs> especially 20th century architecture. I know all about brutalism, which is not something I ever thought I'd know about. Um, I've taught history of museums, which actually goes well with my research and is a class I love to teach. And that class is really fun because in the before times, non-COVID times, we would take students every week to a different museum here in London um, and have them analyze the collections, but also museums as institutions. That was one of my favorite to teach. Um, I've taught in our historiography course, which is our kind of intro to historical practice course that we have here. And then at the London Rare Book School, which is a specialized program um, here in London, they have them in Virginia as well. And if you're at all interested in history, the book and any of this, I recommend looking at the Rare Book School website. They have hundreds of um, lectures up about the history of the book and the history of the map and they're great. Um, but I teach a week long intensive master's course for them on the history of maps and mapping. So that's about eight hours a day of just learning about maps <laughs> really intensively and that's done um, in the summer usually in the before times. Now it'll be done I think digitally which will be a challenge because people can't touch the maps the way they're supposed to. But being a professor is great. I love teaching. <laughs> 
It's fun. I don't like marking or grading, but no one does, so that's okay. There's a question and I've missed it. Okay, in civil engineering, and I'm sure many other professions, we have to look at various types of maps for every project we work on. How would you recommend that you map users today read maps with an awareness of the potential bias they may present? That, I mean, that's tough because those maps especially are um, tricky, I guess. And the main way I think, cause they, they seem very objective. They seem just to show space. And especially if you're looking at a schematic kind of almost like a blueprint, it's almost even empty space. It's just the space that can be imagined and reinterpreted once the thing is constructed. Um, but I think the main thing to remember is that space itself is gendered and cultured. So the way in which, for example, a house, the way in which a house is laid out, even in the US, is very different than the way a house would be laid out here in Britain. Like we said at the beginning, like my washing machines in the kitchen for reasons unknown to me. And that's very common in Britain, but in the US it'd be really weird. Um, and so a same with if you look in terms of Japan, a house will be laid out absolutely differently and it usually be a much smaller. There's just less extra space within us within a house in Japan. And that's a, a, a cultural attribute. So I think an important thing to remember is to, especially if you're designing a space or if you're reading something someone has designed is who is the target audience for this project. And is this targeted towards whatever that the culture of that target audience and I don't mean that in terms of national or ethno ethnographic cultures, but it could be it's for engineers. Um, the Kelly Engineering Building is a very different building than other buildings on campus because it's built for a different purpose. So we need to kind of remember the purpose and the perceived audience and is that audience have a specific understanding of space and just going back to understanding that even space itself is socially conditioned. And I think if you keep that in mind, it helps a bit um, and then if you're interested in especially 20th century maps and how um, they're kind of tricky, there's a great book called How to Lie with Maps, um, and it's by Marc Monmonier, and it's probably the best-selling book in the history of cartography, um, but that's a great, uh, a easy to read kind of more general history of how maps are kind of deceptive. Um, and that doesn't mean they're wrong. That doesn't mean you shouldn't use them. I mean, if you're lost, definitely use a map. Google Maps is okay. I use it all the time. But it, that doesn't, just because we use something doesn't mean it's without bias or that it's neutral, basically. So I was gonna follow up on that kind of, so the way I think most of us interact with maps primarily is different than it has been historically and that we're interacting with you know, our phones telling us directions or something, right? So, and the maps that they're drawing on are uh, dynamic in a kind of different way too. They do incorporate because of the connectivity of phones. Is, there's a lot of information coming in. So you get, you know, there's a speed trap here. The traffic is different here. Um, when you think about that kind of dynamic interactive mapping, what do you think of as like the potentials, but pitfalls of that? Um, so with a lot of digital mapping, it's a pay to play game. So an issue with especially Google map or Waze, um, if you've ever been on Waze, you'll notice that 7-Eleven is always highlighted on Waze. And you're like, why 7-Eleven, why? And that's because they pay Waze to always show you where 7-Eleven is. Google does the same thing. You might be walking and you're like, oh, there's this building there. That's because they've paid Google to identify them within Google Maps. So we need to understand that there is a um, socioeconomic hierarchy going into those. Um, that doesn't mean that the streets themselves are wrong. Again, don't, don't get lost just because I told you maps are sneaky. Um, like the street grids themselves are going to be based on whatever the city plans that they have um, are, and then also those Google mobiles that go around and have the big cameras on them. Um, and that again, has a bit of bias involved because where those cars go and where they don't go are going to deal with um, where people live and then also with socioeconomic status as well. So poorer neighborhoods, more rural areas are going to be less well mapped and less well served by those digital tools um, than those that we live in. Like Corvallis is fine. Um, but if you go into Eastern Oregon, you might run into trouble. 
Um, and we've all been to, or maybe we haven't, but I certainly have. I was um, driving with my husband and my parents in the Lake District, which is a really nice district here in England. And we were going and Google Maps told us to go up this really terrifying road um, that was like single track and there's hedges on either sides. I thought a hedgehog was gonna jump out and like land on the windshield. Um, and <laughs> as we're driving up this road and all of us are like, Google Maps, I think this is a bad idea there's actually a sign that someone's posted outside their farm being like, do not follow sat nav, it is wrong. So there is also a, <laughs> there's always a risk <laughs> to that also being part of it, that they can get things wrong and we're not used to thinking maps are wrong, but they are made by people and they are fallible. Um, so there are many issues with digital mapping, but also thankfully there's a lot of indigenous led projects that are trying to deal with that and then also LGBTQ, LGBTQA plus communities that are also trying to reclaim these tools, especially GIS, ArcGIS um, and OpenStreetMap. So if you want to use a more crowdsourced option then Google Maps, OpenStreetMap is a, is a good option. Um, but again, that is dependent on the crowdsourcing. So if no one has crowdsourced the area you're in, OpenStreetMap's not gonna be very helpful for you. But it is something I worry about that most people encounter maps today in a digital format and that we don't encounter paper or material objects like globes anymore. Um, just because from a historical preservation standpoint, that means that those objects are now in danger, especially maps from the late 20th century. Um, kind of like floppy disks and technology from the 70s onward. Those are the items that A, we can't read because we don't have the technology to read them anymore. Nobody kept floppy disk reading mechanisms. Um, and B, that they're really ephemeral. So a lot of people just threw away maps in National Geographic magazines, for example. And so archives are going to have massive holes in them going forward for these things that people thought weren't important, but in reality were our only historical kind of record of certain kinds of things. Um, and then how to curate digital archives with digital maps, that's a whole new frontier um, that librarians and archivists are really struggling with um, in terms of access, but then in terms of storage and, and all sorts of things like that. So there's a lot of questions left about how do we manage the history of maps when the maps are all in the computer. I don't want to take a lot of student space, but since there's a little pause, one of the things that I think is important for um, current honor students to hear and understand from different perspectives is you look back on your honors experience. Um, what's one takeaway from the, the research and thesis project that you undertook that you maybe wouldn't have guessed at in the moment. I know a lot of students get to that point of like, is it really worth doing the thesis? Do I really need the honors degree that much? So from your perspective, what's one thing that came out of that process that, you know, when you were here, you might not have guessed at, but that's been valuable to kind of where you've ended up? Sure, I mean, doing the thesis is hugely valuable. <laughs> um, it, it gave me such a leg up when I got to graduate school. Um, I and my fellow graduate students acknowledged that I was miles ahead of everyone else in terms of understanding archival work and writing a document that was over, most of them had never written anything over 10 or 15 pages. And I'd written something that mine ended up, I think being around 85 or so, um, cause we don't have word limits, yay. Um, <laughs> in Britain they have word limits, which is a bummer. Um, and so having done an archive led project with actual historical sources, put me in great stead for graduate school. And graduate school was, for me, I mean, graduate school is never great for everyone. It's a really hard time in terms of you're poor. And then it's just a really difficult mentally to get through because it's hard and there's a lot of pressure on you. But in terms of the actual courses and the work and the archives, I was in heaven. It was wonderful. And the UHC was the first time in my experience where it was cool to be smart. I had been bullied quite seriously um, in middle school and high school for being the smart kid. And the UHC was the first place that forwarded intelligence and interest and kind of liked that we would take courses in all sorts of things. I took a CS Lewis course. I took a ethnomusicology course. 
um, I think I took some sort of murder mystery law and order course um, with Susan Shaw, which was amazing. And so that, that was the first time it was kind of cool to just be interested in things. And then graduate school was that times 100. And so that really helped my rather low self-confidence was to finally get to be with a community of people that just like to know things and like to learn things and kind of like to know the answers on Jeopardy. That was new. Um, and that was really, really fun. But that said, do not leave your thesis until the last quarter. Because I definitely wrote it all in the, I did the research before, but I did not write it to the last quarter and that was very stressful. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. And get to know your mentor. It's, I am still super close with my thesis mentor. I see him every time I come to Corvallis and we, he, they're like extra parents. I'm not saying everyone's relationship will be like that, but they're a great resource and it's a really unique um, opportunity to get to work with them on something like a thesis project. Could I ask who mentored your project if it's someone still at OSU? Sure, he's emeritus now, but it's Robert Nye. Um, so he, he comes down from his house on the hill every now and again. <laughs> Um, and if you ask, he would teach again, so. <laughs> and he specialized in the history of sexuality. I wanna be mindful, I know um, some of you actually have one o'clock classes and we just have a couple minutes left, but if we can all thank Dr. Parker for the fun presentation and conversation, so. Thank you guys. Thanks for chatting with me. I love talking with Oregon State people. <laughs>